she's broken barriers for so many of us, actors, dancers, singers. She basically was the Asian Ginger Rogers of her time. Things are pretty tough. It's already tough enough trying to get a job and then try to get a job during the depression. And you're Asian, so who, who's gonna hire a minority? And she was happiest on stage. So I think that was her, that was her reward, really, was the applause. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, with a big round of applause, the sensational Oriental dance team of Toy and Wing. My name is Dorothy Shigeko Takahashi. And then I uh, went and changed it to a stage name, Dorothy Toy. And I was born in uh, May 28, 1917. This is a long time ago. May I present to you the only oriental review of its kind in the country. Let it go, boys. <laughs> do a cartwheel on stage and just watching the way she lights up and the passion that she has as a teacher almost just infused me with passion and from that I feel like you couldn't ever have a better teacher. She has broken barriers for so many of us, actors, dancers, singers, and despite the hardships of having to leave home, the financial hardships, the hardships of World War II and the internment and being Japanese during that time, she still came through on top as a star dancer. I am so grateful to have had Auntie Dorothy in my life and I hope I can make her proud. 
For nearly a century, Dorothy has dedicated her life to dancing. She has no regrets. Oh, I loved it. When you're dancing, it's like you're in another world. And so I enjoy it so much that the public enjoys it. And that's how we dance, Paul and I, we dance. We loved it. It came across to the audience and they were very good to us. But we went through a lot, a lot of prejudice, everything. But you have to face it. Dancing is something that will keep you very happy. I'm happy that I danced all my life. Welcome to East Meets West, Chinatown Nightclubs. I'm Ron Shen, Executive Director for the Bay Area Chinese Genealogy Group. I have the honor of being the host and moderator for today's session. Today I'm with David Yick, Board President of the Chinese Historical Cultural Project, who is co-hosting this session. Hey, Dave. Hi, Ron. Glad to be here with you. I'm pleased to welcome Kelvin Fong, son of a nightclub owner and two entertainers spanning three decades of dance, Kobe Yi and Cynthia Yi. I've had a special treat with our virtual cocktail lounge. I've never been to a Chinese nightclub, so we wanted to show you what a night on the town would be in the fabulous 40s, with dancing, magicians, singers, and of course, the sweet sounds of big band music. Hats off to Will Lee for video creation, Rick Kwan's documentary footage, plus the many photo contributors so we could remember and honor the golden age of Chinese American nightclubs. Thanks Will and the webinar tech team for pushing levers, flipping switches, and pulling the strings to make my mouth move. I'd now like to introduce the Bay Area Chinese Genealogy Group. First slide, please. The Barrier Chinese Genealogy Group mission is to educate and share family history. It's important to know that our children know the past so they could appreciate their future. To help with your genealogy goals, our website has posts like free 20-minute family history research consultations, tutorials on how to scan, colorize, and restore photos, negatives, and slides, searching for Angel Island immigration documents, the ultimate genealogy junkie high was tracing my lineage back 1,500 generations to 2698 BC to the first emperor of the Chinese people. But the real success of documenting family history is how to turn boring birth and death details into the story of their lives. Example of a boring detail. My mother had seven siblings. The story of their lives. Dinner from mom as a child was crushed saltine crackers in hot water. Two brothers and a sister died in poverty, one on the way to America, the Gold Mountain. Although our focus is genealogy, we hold sessions like this to help weave historical and family histories together. Ron Chun left a message on our site. I'm very interested in symbols of self-empowerment and self-sufficiency, which is exemplified in Chinese American genealogy. Chinese Americans helping other Chinese Americans in finding their past, legacy, and future. 
This presentation is part of the spirit. Thanks, Ron, for explaining why we do webinars far more eloquently than I. It is with this mission, our genealogy group grew in 15 minutes from eight people in my living room to 100 members. With this webinar, we now have 300 new best friends in you. Dave, can you share what CHCP is all about? Next slide, please. Greetings all. CHCP and I are excited and honored to co-sponsor this webinar with Ron and his team. What is CHCP? Well, we run the Chinese American Historical Museum, but we're much more than a museum. We have our annual membership dinner and we celebrate things like Chinese New Year's, Qingming, Halloween, and Christmas. And we also do a Spirit of 45 celebration involving thousands of uh, attendees and uh, troops bivouacking, jeeps, and uh, big band music. It's a fun event. Uh, we do a speaker series. Uh, for example, recent webinar that included discussion about the PBS series, Asian Americans, and featured as panelists was Donald Jung, the executive producer for this PBS series. Connie Young Yu, noted Chinese American author and historian. Uh, and Gordon Smith, vice president of the local Japanese American Museum. Another example of our speaker series was part of Silicon Valley Reads, where we featured a film about Paula Madison, a Black American journalist, writer, NBC executive, corporate vice president of General Electric and a former owner of the WNBA team, the LA Sparks, which she later sold to Magic Johnson. Her grandfather was Chinese and our film showed her journey tracing her family lineage all the way back to 1000 BC. Our organization also uh, has an immigration story program where we sponsor field trips to thousands of elementary school children when did this all begin? Well, we over 30 years ago, uh, 1987, uh, we raised funds to uh, create a, a new museum, a replica of the temple that was the anchor of the Chinese uh, community in San Jose. And that was done four years uh, after the start and with a lot of financial support from the community. Where are we located? We're in a history park in San Jose, which includes a number of museums, historical buildings, vintage car trolley cars and rides, and a historic hotel with an ice cream parlor and gift shop. We also have a light tower that was the inspiration for the Eiffel Tower and a Japanese friendship garden in Kelly Park nearby. How to find out more? Go to our website, thcp.org, where you can take a virtual tour of our museum find out more about membership benefits. And I'd like to call your attention to the fact that we have a half price introductory special for 2020 membership, a special for attendees at this webinar. Next slide, please, and then back to Ron. I'd like to share the backstory of how BACGG and CHCP came together. The genealogy group is less than two years old. CHCP is 30 years our senior. So they've become our Dai Ga, or Chinese for Big Brother. After the genealogy group did our first webinar, Dave Yick called to congratulate us and said he'd like to invite his membership of 200 to this nightclub session. I almost fell off my chair. The genealogy group only has a Zoom license for 100, and we have 100 of our own members. But this is when the stars lined up. CHCP provided the technical and funding support to do this webinar. This allowed us to send out 15 times more invitations and register four times more than our total membership. Dajia, Chinese for thank you, Dai Ga. Partnering with CHCP has allowed us to scale beyond our wildest imagination. Here's our agenda for today. Sending out questions is critical to the webinar's success. 
So we will review how to use the Zoom Q&A function. Calvin Fong, Keynote, will share how we grew up in the glow of Chinatown Neon. We'll take a five minute break and then the virtual cocktail lounge will resume. Then we'll welcome our panelists, then a sneak preview to our next webinar, ending with a poll for feedback for future sessions. The webinar slides, audio and video will be posted on the BACGG website. As how we're going to address Q&A, let's go to our next slide, please. We encourage you to send questions throughout the webinar. They will be addressed during our panel session. Today's input will be integrated into the four dozen questions we already received in advance. It's impossible to answer every question in the short time we have, so outstanding questions will be answered on our site. So let's review how to submit a question. Go to the bottom of your Zoom toolbar, click Q&A, type the question, click Send, click X to close the Q&A window. Next slide, please, to introduce our speaker, Calvin Fong. Calvin is the son of Fong Wen, owner of multiple San Francisco and Chinatown nightclubs. In the 1940s, his mother worked as a part-time evening hostess at the Oakland Club. She didn't want to leave young children at home, so she brought them to the club. The kids had to sit way in the back or up in the balcony quietly. Calvin watched the shows drinking cherry Cokes, fascinated by the variety and talent of the performers. He was equally mesmerized by the magicians and acrobats. In between shows, a few of the performers would occasionally sit and chat. One of the magicians even showed the kids a few simple magic tricks. In the early 1950s, his parents would take him and his siblings to the Club Shanghai in San Francisco Chinatown on Friday nights. His mother was busy running the club and his mother chatted with employees, friends and entertainers in the back room. The only time the kids were allowed, i.e. forced into the kitchen, was when the exotic dancers came on stage. Without further ado, Calvin, take it away. Well, hi everybody. And thank you, Ron, and thank you, David. I hope everyone enjoyed the Cocktail Lounge because it really is a tribute to the many talented Asian performers during the golden age of the Chinatown nightclubs. They were truly pioneers and they also helped open doors for today's generation of Asian performers. Doors that were not open to them in the 1940s through the 1960s. Now, it wasn't easy to be a performer if you were Asian. They also had to fight against cultural traditions. Some had to go against the wishes of their parents in order to become singers and dancers. A few even had to run away from home to chase their dreams. So fortunately, there were Chinese-owned nightclubs during this period. Now, what happened for lots of different reasons was that they all of a sudden became very popular. And that popularity is fairly unique to the clubs in San Francisco Chinatown and one in Oakland in particular. In fact, they became so popular that they became points of destination. People came to San Francisco just to go to the Chinatown nightclubs. Many of the Hollywood elite took the train or flew into San Francisco just to see the Chinese Fred Astaire or the Chinese Ginger Rogers or the Chinese Franz, um, Frank Sinatra. With this presentation, I'm gonna focus on my, fa my father, Fong Wan Snyderies. So let's get started and draw back the curtain here. You see a map of San Francisco Chinatown in the 1940s through the 50s. And you see all these different clubs. I show about 12 here, but there were many more. This is not a complete list of all the clubs in and around the Chinatown area. Some were also on the outskirts of Chinatown. Now granted, most of these clubs were relatively small. There were bistros, cocktail lounges. 
However, the fact that there were so many indicates that Chinatown after dark was no sleeping hamlet. In other words, it's really different, a contrast from what it was yesterday compared to today, sad to say. But there were also a few larger clubs, what I call restaurant sized clubs. And probably the most popular ones are these that I will highlight in, in yellow here. I'm gonna magnify it. And you can see right here, Charlie Lowe's Forbidden City was probably the number one hotspot of all the clubs. And the Kobe E family took over the Forbidden City in the 60s and continued the tradition. And then there's Ada Pond's Kuba Khan and my father's Club Shanghai. Fong Wan took over the Club Shanghai in the mid 40s from D.W. Low. And you have here Annie Wong's Sky Room. So these four, you can see we're within, we're within a two block area. And then if you go further down Grand Avenue, then you have the Lions and Tommy Tong's Lions Den, which was built the Chinatown's only underground nightclub. And that was because it was in the basement of the Kowa Cafe. Now, Charlie was the one that popular, popularized the all Chinese review, meaning it was an all Asian performance. And if you didn't have a Chinese sounding name, he gave you one. And if you didn't like it, you were not gonna perform in his club. So that's how he strict he was in terms of having an all Asian review. My father, Fong Wan, on the other hand, wanted more of a, a lighter cabaret style club. And so he really embraced vaudeville. In fact, sometimes some of his shows were bordered on the circus-like atmosphere. He had tumblers, jugglers, trapeze artists, magicians. He didn't have clowns, but he had slapstick comedy. He didn't have elephants and tigers, but he did, believe it or not, dog shows. Dogs that actually jumped hoops and did somersaults. Here you see four clubs that my father owned and they did not exist simultaneously, which I will explain a little bit later. My father, his profession was really a Chinese medicine man. In other words, he specialized in herbal medicine. So the question comes up is why did he become a club owner? Why did he get into the restaurant business? In fact, that was the very question the, the San Francisco Chronicle reporter asked him in 1949. And this is what he said, to put my dependents to work. Now, my father had an intense loyalty to his parents. He also had loyalty to his brothers and sisters, what they call filial piety. I think you've heard of that term, loyalty to the family. And so what he did, he helped support and brought over his younger brother. He brought over several of his nephews and he brought other relatives as well as time went by. And obviously they all couldn't work at the herb store. What in fact they really did, but he needed to broaden their income base. So he decided to go into the nightclub business. So he bought the small cafe just outside of Oakland Chinatown. It was a bankrupt cafe, and he was determined to make it a first-class dine and dance club. Now, he, too, he used two marketing strategies, one unconventional, and the second one was very radical. So you see here, and this is important, he decided that his cafe was going to be healthy, a healthy Chinese food and American food. And let me explain that in a little bit more detail.
Now, as I mentioned earlier, the Bankrupt Cafe was just outside of Oakland Chinatown. And I think that was the reason it didn't do well because it was not inside Chinatown. And back then, if you want good old fashioned Chinese food, you would go to Chinatown, right? Now, one of his strategies was to broaden the market base since it was outside of Oakland Chinatown. It was to include American dishes as well. Now, I read it, a scholarly article that mentioned that a combination of Chinese and American dishes in a Chinese restaurant back in the 20s was very uncommon, especially in the big cities like San Francisco and Oakland, where you had a relatively large Chinese population. In the smaller towns where there are very, very few Chinese, of course, in order to, to make a profit, you would have to incorporate American dishes, but not in the big cities. It was uncommon. So that was one of his marketing strategies. Now, the second one was even more radical. But before I talk about that, I want to show you the second story of the new Shanghai Cafe. That's where many of his dependents stayed when they came over. Later, he would also have the performers that he brought over from China stay there as well. But obviously, there wasn't enough room for everyone to stay there. So guess where some of the performers, as well as our dependents, stayed at? In our house. And I'll go into a little bit more detail later. So eating healthy. What eating healthy in a Cantonese restaurant? Cantonese restaurants typically use what? A lot of animal fat, lard to make it, to give that taste, but not so with my father. And this is where the herbalist side of him comes out. Here's an ad in back in 1929. He says, he says here, chief aim to promote good health. And notice the second bullet will not serve strongly peppered, highly seasoned, greasy foods. In other words, no animal fat. Use only first class pure peanut oil. So that was the strategy. In fact, this was probably the first health food restaurant in the country. Again, this is where the herbalist side of him comes out, where, where he talks about the benefits of certain types of herbs. And this was a 1927 ad where he says, water chestnuts, good for high fevers, especially good when cooked with minced pork. And then he puts a plug in for his, his Shanghai Cafe, well prepared at the new Shanghai Cafe. So there's a combination ad where he really endorses herbal medicine at the same time, endorses cafe because it serves good food and, and healthy food. Now, here are some very unique ads that he put out in the 1930s. As most of you probably know, Chinese cooking is based on the five natural elements. The five natural elements are also the foundation of traditional Chinese medicine as well. It's also a foundational element of Chinese philosophy. And here he mentions how these five natural elements are used in Chinese cooking. And when done, done properly, he says, when these five elements are exactly proportioned, the food balance is near to helpful perfection. And same with the human body. If these five elements are in natural harmony, then you're healthy, you're not sick. So he was carrying on this philosophy into his restaurants. Quite unique in the 20s and 30s. Now, the second phase, going on to 1938, <clears throat> he decides to expand his restaurant. And this time, to really make it a, a vaudeville-type entertainment. And he goes all out. And you can see the expansion here. This was the, initially the two-story building. He buys an additional three parcels next to it and builds a really first-class Chinese nightclub. And he builds it as the largest, most complete Chinese club, the supper club 
on the coast. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But it had a floor space of 22,000 square feet, plus it can accommodate over 500 people. So that's a decent sized club. Now, this was his first Chinese performer at the Shanghai Cafe, none other than J. Dean Wong herself. By 1938, J. Dean was already in a Hollywood movie. And the movie came out in 1939, I believe. And then she came up to San Francisco to dance at my father's club. I won't have time to get into her interesting background, but Jadine Wong was one of those young ladies that ran away from home because she wanted to become a dancer. She not only ran away from home once, she actually ran away from home twice. As I mentioned before, my father loved great vaudeville acts. He was fortunate to get one of the pre premier magicians, the great Lester or Lester the Great. And he was written up in Life Magazine and Look Magazine. And this was one of his, of his most famous acts of sawing a young lady in half. And this is what one viewer said, so perfect is the illusion that even at close range of four feet, I could detect no trickery. The entire act is performed under bright lights, full view of the, of the audience. I know the girl was unhar unharmed because I took her out for soda after the show. So he loved that act. And there were many other shows too. I'm, I don't know if you know what shadow graphing is. It's basically using your hands uh, with, with, with a blank backdrop and full lights on your hand and you're making these funny animal characters and, and faces. So that was an unusual, but it was a truly a vaudeville act. And so he had many other acts as well. So in two years alone, he had over 90 outstanding performing acts there. In 1940, he decides to expand even further. It morphs from a supper club to a super night club. He names it the Terrace Bowl. And you can see here, he expands one parcel even more and builds this huge 40 foot dome. And here you get an indication of how it looked on the inside. He dug out the first floor, so it, it looked like a bowl. And then you can see the tables here. He tears the tables. So didn't matter where you sat, you got a good view of the dance floor. And in the back was where the, the band or the orchestra played. And he also had a built-in pipe organ. As I mentioned, the ceiling is 40 feet high, painted in midnight blue. And it also had kind of a starry uh, reflection. So it felt like you were outside in a dark lit sky with many stars. And there was a balcony section that goes all around the, the room. And so the overflow crowd would sit up in the balcony as well as the kids. And by the way, the terrace boat was able to sit over a thousand people. That's how huge it was. So here's our friend, I'm sure everybody knows, Sammy Tom. And he was one of the first MCs at the terrace boat. And I want to briefly mention George Wright. Now, George Wright was an organist. Uh, and this was his first professional gig. This is where he got his start. So, and he was so popular that a, a local radio station picked up on his music and then broadcast the music over, over radio on many of the nights when he was playing at the Terrace Bowl. And so he got his start at the Terrace Bowl and he eventually became one of the last of the great theater organists. 
Uh, this is what he said in his memoirs. Some of my experience would defy telling and against postal censorship regulations. For one thing, I shared a dressing room with a fan dancer named Lotus Lee. All of this too for the magnificent sum of $56.60 weekly paid by my ever loving boss, Dr. Fong Wan. And Lotus Lee, by the way, was Japanese. And for obvious reasons, she had to change her name, just, just like Dorothy Toy and her sister Helen Toy had to change her, their names. His magic shows, he always had magic shows. Now, Chan Lu was a first generation Chinese. He was also the first professional Chinese magician in America. And he tells us that he became a magician because he was a lousy busboy. And again, I won't have time to go into that, but when he was an apprentice and he was touring with his mentor going through Iowa, and Iowa evidently has never seen a real live Asian before. And so he got arrested as a Japanese spy. Theta Loy was one of my father's favorite fan dancers in the early 40s. And you see the fans there? Now, I don't know how much those fans weigh, but it reminds me of a story in Arthur Dong's Forbidden City USA book. And in the book, it talks about Noel Toy. Noel Toy was one of the early fan dancer, bubble dancers at the Forbidden City. And according to the story, her particular fans actually weighed 25 pounds each. In other words, she was juggling 50 pounds of fans. Now, I don't know how true that is. I don't believe the one state of law is, weighs that much. But the way the story goes is that one night when she was dancing, she lost her balance. And what happened, she fell onto a table of a customer who was eating chow mein. And to prop herself up, she accidentally stuck her hand into the plate of chow mein. And without missing a beat, she said, excuse me, it's okay. Help yourself, meaning help yourself to the chow mein that was dripping off fingers. I also want to mention the years. You notice, for example, that Theta Lloyd was danced at the Club Oakland 1948-49. It doesn't mean that she was there 12 months out of the year. It just meant that she danced at those particular years. And the contract would be normally from four weeks to several months. So that's, that's what it means. By December, 1941, you can see the, the program here. And my father was drifting toward an all Asian performance now, but he kept George Wright because he, he was popular as an organist. And my father, my father just loved the guy. Sammy Tong, he was a staple at my father's club. You can see the, the different years that he performed at all three clubs there. And of course, his claim to fame was in Hollywood in Bachelor Father. And the Bachelor Father series actually ran for about five seasons. And he did about 157 episodes. So he did quite well. And of course, you have to have the dancers and this is the Mei Ling Trio with Jackie Mei Ling, and he's dancing here with Mary Mammon and Dottie's son. They often dance together, but oftentimes they would rotate and have other partners as well. Toyet Mar, called the Chinese Sophie Tucker. And she had a unique boisterous voice, and that's the reason why she was compared to Sophie Tucker. But she also had a unique act. She was a natural comedian. So she inter intertwined comedy with her singing. 
and there are the Sen Wongs. I believe they started at the Forbidden City. There were ballroom dancers. And here it talks about him doing or them doing a pleasing rumba and a good cakewalk. Do you know what a cakewalk dance is? Well, again, I won't have time to go into the details, but the cakewalk dance was originated by black slaves before the Civil War. And of course, the acrobats. My father brought over, I think, three, at least three or four teams of acrobats throughout the 1940s. And this is probably one of the early groups of acrobats that he brought over. And you can see Manly Fong is actually doing some acrobatic work, acrobatic things on this pole, 19, this 26 foot pole. And you can only do this at the terrace bowl because it's 40 feet high ceiling. And then the middle picture is the Club Shanghai where the guy stands on his hand, like I guess six chairs or so over these wine bottles with a thin neck. That always impressed me. And there's Bobby Chan, who's on upside down on his head, swinging on the trapeze. And Fei Ying, she was also a bubble and fan dancer. But I wanted to show you this picture and show you this dress. This dress, this picture of this dress was just taken last month. And I wanted to thank Joanna Watson Wong, the daughter of Fei Ying, for sending me these pictures. And this was the very dress that she wore in 1943. And it's still well-preserved. So it's what, 77, at least 77 years old. Now, Fei in Fei Ying means what? To fly. And so Fei Ying could mean butterfly or it could also mean fly like an eagle. So here you can see how graceful she is as if she was a butterfly or fly like an eagle. So here, I want to combine these two. He began to downsize around 1946. So he sold part of the building to a church and it became, and this part of the club became the club Oakland. And a year later, he bought the club Shanghai from DW Low and made that into a big night, big nightclub as well. And I want to talk about these together because it shows the, the different dancers, but the dancers dance at each club and they tend to rotate. And you can see one of his advertisements here showing the variety and the numbers of shows that were going on in each club. And they would dance at one club and then they would shift over to the other club and dance at the other club. Now here's opening night at the Club Shanghai. And here we have Kobe Yi dancing at opening night. And then, of course, Jadine Wong with her partner, Lee Sun. Robin Wing was actually Filipina, but they changed her name to Robin Wing. She was an MC and singer as well. And Willie Sang was, was also a singer and he was also an MC at the club. And Willie was the brother of Mei Tai Sing. And here are the Tai Sings. This was one of my father's favorite dancing duel. And sometimes they were referred to as the Chinese Fred and Ginger. And so you can see the different years that they dance at the Terrace Bowl and the Club Shanghai. And of course, you can't say anything without saying something about the bubble dancers and the fan dancers. Barbara Young was a, a staple at my father's club. You can see the different years that she performed at the Club Shanghai 
in Club Oakland. Lana Wong was an import. She, she, my father brought her over from Hong Kong just to dance at his clubs. And Lana Wong was one of those performers that actually stayed at our house. You can guess that not, did not go well with my mother. Tony Wing was a very popular tap dancer, choreographer. He was actually a mixture of ethnicities. He's part Chinese, part Portuguese, part Spanish, part Filipino. And Charlie Wong forced him to change his name to Tony Wing. I think his last name was Lagrimas. He not only made him change his name, but Tony's hair was not dark enough, so he made Tony dye his hair black. And of course, there's a, the incomparable toy and wing that also danced at, at the Club Shanghai. And so this is the next slide. My father's great grandson, or my, or my grandson, Dominic. He's aspiring to be an acrobat, something like Charlie Chur, where he can balance everything. He's trying to balance, there he goes, balance a ring on top of his head. Is he gonna make it? He does it, oops. Hola, hola. I can thank my brother Alan for giving me the slide. And by the end of the nightclub era for my father, he had over 600 different entertainers dancing at his clubs. And I think if he was alive today, he would be proud that he was able to provide for his dependents. He was able to fulfill the filial piety that he promised his parents. I think he can also be proud, along with the other Chinese club owners, that they helped the entertainers of that day to fulfill the dreams. As Dorothy Toy said in her documentary, she was happy. She was happy because she was a dancer and she felt fulfilled. And I suppose that's all any of us could say in this life is to be happy and to feel fulfilled. So I thank you for the time that you're taking and listening. So I will turn over the program back to Ron Chan. Thank you, Calvin, for giving such a fun and firm foundation of the golden age of Chinese American nightclubs. But it's not over yet. Joining Calvin are two lovely ladies, the darlings of dance, Kobe Yi and Cynthia Yi, right after this five minute break. We will continue our virtual cocktail lounge with its bevy of beauties to relive these magical moments. See you in five. Cue video, please.
Welcome back. <laughs> we will now start the panel. We okay. received many, many questions. So I lumped the questions into six categories. Breaking stereotypes, sex sells, life on the road, risky business, legacy, and I want more. So let me introduce our panelists. Next slide, please. Let me just say hi. Hello, everybody. Hey, Kobe. Hey, Cynthia. <laughs> Hi. You ladies look gorgeous. You too, Thank Calvin. You. <laughs> <laughs> the headliners for tonight's panel are Calvin Fong, son of a successful nightclub owner, backed by an all-star chorus lineup. Kobe Yi, known as China's most daring dancing doll, who, by the way, is only four foot eleven. Kobe is dancing started dancing in the 1940s and soon became a mainstay in Asian nightclubs, particularly Charlie Lowe's Forbidden City in San Francisco. She performed all over the country through the 1950s and 60s. When Louis Armstrong's wife saw her perform, she compared Kobe to Gypsy Rose Lee, saying, Kobe, honey, you out gypsy gypsy. Kobe blazed a trail for herself, first as a performer, and then as a nightclub owner, buying Forbidden City in 1962, running it until 1970. 93 years young, she is honored with the 2020 Living Legend Award from the Burlesque Hall of Fame. Cynthia Yi lived in the same apartment building as the famous Dorothy Toy. Dorothy needed a substitute dancer and called Cynthia, who was only 17 at the time, and the rest is history. In 1967, Cynthia won the prestigious Miss Chinatown Crown, performing a dance choreographed by Dorothy Toy. By the late 1960s, the nightclub scene in San Francisco had been transformed. The success of, success of Carol Dota and the Broadway strip clubs forced nightclub owners to add more stripping and exotic dancing into their shows. Chinese nightclubs marketed oriental shows featuring China dolls in seductive costumes. However, Chinese strip shows were relatively tame as performers typically only stripped down to a bikini with generous cleavage. Cynthia traveled through North and South America, Japan and Europe, entertaining in Chinatowns and clubs around the world. Can we now begin the panel session? This is a rare opportunity to hear the same question answered in three different ways. From the stage, 
Kobe can speak of the 40s and 50s. Cynthia from the 60s. Kobe and Calvin's father were nightclub owners, so you could get a view of their world from behind the cash register. So let me set the stage. It's 3 a.m. Kobe, Cynthia, and Calvin's father just finished a grueling three-show night. The four of us are sitting in a dimly lit back room, exhausted, but elated, still a glow from a standing applause. A cigarette is burning down on one hand, a cocktail in the other. You'll see a, you see an empty table nearby, and you sit, and you overhear this conversation. Breaking stereotype. I thought a good Chinese girl didn't smile or show teeth or expose bare arms and certainly not bare legs. How did you get into the nightclub business? Kobe, You're would talking you like to, to start? me, Ron, yes. Hi, yes. Ron. Hey. Hi, Sherry in Hawaii. That's my daughter. <laughs> and I got into show business when I was a little girl. My father's club members wanted me to come and dance for them. So uh, I put on my tap shoes. He took me there, and I did my two-minute act, and I got $5. That's how I got in show business. But soon after that, I got an offer to get $10. So that was some of the fairs in Ohio, like the, uh, you know, the uh, Columbus, Ohio State Fair. I'd go there and dance. I'd get my $10. And then later on, I did uh, some amateur shows. I might have made twenty dollars. <laughs> see, I graduated, but then after, I thought, well, gee, um, I can't just be doing uh, my little tap dance. Uh, I want to take you know more lessons and uh, do a bigger act because I had gone to Washington D.C. to see my uncle's restaurant, theater restaurant. It was called the Casino Royal. They had a big band. They had a nightclub show. And the dancing horse girls were beautiful. And they wanted me to do my little tap dance. Well, they put makeup on me. I went out there and I wiggled and I loved it. I said, I want to be in show business. So the manager said, well, you can't just do a tap dance. You got to do more than a tap dance. You got to have an act. I said, well, okay. So he sent me to a choreographer. They gave me an act. It started out with, you know, me moving my head, doing my shoulders, maybe shaking my hips. They said, well, now you got an act. Now you got to have a costume. Well, my mother said, well, I'll make you a hat similar to what I've got. She liked Chinese opera. So she made a hat for me. She trained me how to do it. My dad made me a, a, a well, I guess you call it a clothes hanger because I took off my jacket. And he says, you can't put your jacket on the floor. So he made this sign. It said 42nd and Broadway. It's like a, uh, you know, like a lamppost. So I take off my hat. I take off my jacket. I wiggle out of my pants and I hang them all up. They don't go on the floor. They go on hangers. So then I picked up my uh, maracas and I did a samba. See, I started out as a little Chinese girl from China, but I ended up like a Latin Manhattan girl. <laughs> That's my story. <laughs> well, I was lucky, Kobe, because I started in 1963 uh, in the Dorothy Toy Show, and we made $65 a week. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> and with the $65, we had to pay our lodging, our food, and I even had a few dollars left over to send to my mom every, uh, every week. So eventually, I got $125, and... Mm. Uh, that helped with expenses, especially when we were in Europe, because things were expensive. Yeah, I think all the performers were at, paid at least union wages because the Actors Guild and the Musician Guild at that time were very strong. And the, for example, the acrobats that came over from Hong Kong also had to join the union if they wanted to perform. And so they complained about the money, the dues that they had to pay the unions out of their salaries. That's true. Yeah. Right, you know, we got a, uh, a question from Monica. And, you know, the question is, is that, you know, you ladies started pretty young. Um, 
did you feel fairly safe in this type of environment in the wild yeah, west of the yeah. nightclub? Oh, yeah. There was never a problem. You know, we always had escorts or a manager or other show people were always around. Never, never had a problem. Very yeah, safe. Yeah, Dorothy Toy was always very protective of the girls. And she was very uh, fussy about uh, when we went out to uh, the dining room, if someone wanted to buy us a drink or to meet us. And she would go out first, check out everything, and then <laughs> <laughs> gave us permission. In fact, that's how I met my husband. She met him first. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Chinese parents have a tendency to be pretty conservative. I mean, how did they receive this news that you wanted to be an entertainer? Well, my family was wonderful because, like I said, my mother made my headdress, made my costume, and my daddy made my this stand this beautiful stand that I could hang my clothes on so they were always involved so it was never a question of uh, the uh, well actually it was a dollar signs if you know what I mean but I was able to make pretty good money you know as a teenager so that that's where that all came from <laughs> yeah I was very lucky because uh, it was Dorothy Toy's show and my mom knew Dorothy, and so we were like family friends, and uh, Dorothy was the one that sent me to ballet school. And so she trusted uh, uh, Dorothy and her sister Helen, and um, so it, it made all the difference in the world. And But we were safe. I mean, it, it's I think it was safer then than it is walking down the street now. <laughs> <laughs> so the next topic, sex sells. Charlie Lowe owner of the Forbidden City was asked, what's so forbidden about it? And he said, my beautiful oriental girls, look but don't touch. How risque really were Chinatown nightclubs for its time? Well, the word risque is not really a word that was in my act. You know, I, <laughs> I always fashioned my whole act out of the fact that I made all my wardrobe. I made beautiful uh, robes. I'd come out in a Chinese opera type robe. I'd go down to American robe and maybe a, a see-through sheer robe. And uh, it was not risque. It was a fashion show. <laughs> okay. In our show, we had an exotic dancer. And uh, it was a number choreographed by Dorothy. And um, what happens is that the two girls on the side assisting the exotic dancer would uh, receive all the clothes, put it on, and by the end of the number, the one in the center with the feather fan uh, would be the one that would that was the one that was uh, revealing herself. But it was so quick because it was only like maybe three seconds of this wonderful gel called Midnight Blue. And uh, so it was very beautiful and very seductive, but, uh, just leave you wanting more. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there was a law against being 100% nude at that time. And what little I remember when I was young, when we were able to take peeks at the bubble dancers, <laughs> that at the very end, when they're almost nude, completely nude, but they're not, and they have the bubbles in front of them or the big fans in front of them. And then when they're ready to expose themselves, the lights go out. So you don't really see anything. <laughs> you know, Kobe, when we talked a little bit earlier, you said this, one of the secrets of your success was reveal and conceal. Can you tell me that story? Well, uh, that uh, first started when I was training some uh, young dancers, they wanted to be in show business and do an act sim similar to mine. So I opened a, a studio in Chinatown called the Chinatown Dance Studio. So that's where I trained the girls how to reveal and conceal with costumes that I would make for them. So they learned the whole act from me. And uh, I would, at that time, then I was able to book them to other uh, clubs. So I was kind of in the booking business and teaching business and also performing as a, a performer. So Charlie always thought, well, gee, you gotta spend more time over here. 
because I was running back and forth over to my cocktail lounge, which I had on Broadway Street, called the Dragon Lady. And that's where we had a piano bar. We had a nice pianist. And a lot of the um, folks, would, the, the show people would come in and perform. Uh, I didn't have to pay them. I only paid a piano player. So uh, apparently the union didn't mind that because they were guest stars. So I had that going. Uh, a lot, I had a lot going on when I was working for Charlie because I was making good money. So I invested it in that uh, dancing school in a bar in Chinatown. And uh, so I that's what I was doing. I was a busy lady. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to become just as busy as you, Kobe. Uh, I am on the board of directors of the Clarion Performing Arts Center, and uh, it's an intimate theater, and it gives um, artists the opportunity to, to hone their act and also take lessons there. And uh, if you're a poet or a dancer or a singer uh, or an actress, you could definitely showcase your talent there. And uh, I am in the process of opening a magic cellar on the downstairs level. And it will have the magic actually inspired by Ah Hing, whom I worked with at the Forbidden City and Sky Room. And he was also my neighbor upstairs. Uh, and he had these doves all the time that were cooing in the back porch. And so at the age of uh, 10 years old, I saw him for the first time and I just loved magic from then on. And so I'm gonna have a magic seller and also we're gonna mm. feature jewelry and accessories from the uh, Forbidden City Showgirl um, line. So we'll have earrings, uh, jewelry, bling bling, feathers, everything that you will need to, to be beautiful and to uh, also pretend you're a showgirl in case you didn't have the chance to do so because your mom didn't let you. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there was a question that came up and regarding the audience, I mean, was this a family show or was this, you know, mainly men? I mean, who typically went to a Chinese night nightclub? Well, uh, I know during the time that uh, Charlie had it, uh, also when we uh, bought the Forbidden City, uh, we uh, catered mostly to the tourists. You know, we uh, we have busloads of tourists come in. They uh, were on a nightclub uh uh, circuit, I mean, nightclub scene, I believe. They would just see three different nightclubs. So we do our first show for a whole bunch of tourists. They leave, and we, the whole new bus load came in, and we did our second show. We did that three times a night, and we performed for a lot of people from all over the world. And when then I after... <laughs> oh, go ahead. Go ahead, yeah, Cynthia. And through. then after they left the Forbidden City, the bus would take them up to the Sky Room. And yeah. so that's when we did our shows. And so after our show, then the bus would go on to Pinocchio's on Broadway and then over to Bimbo's 365. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I think the Chinese clubs back in the 40s and 50s were fairly unique in terms of audience. I mean, it was open to all. So you not only have the young servicemen come, but you would have families coming to the shows. Like I said in my presentation, my father loved vaudeville. So he had a large variety of different acts that families can enjoy. And it was a mixed crowd. It, it wasn't just whites and Asians, but there were blacks coming into the club. Whereas as far as I know, the black clubs, as well as the white clubs at that time, kind of stuck to their own ethnic group. I don't believe there was any laws at that time segregating them, but it was just kind of a natural uh, phenomenon. I recall my one of my older brothers actually went to a black nightclub and he could feel the stares, you know, the people just staring at them because I guess see, they weren't black and so they felt uncomfortable so going to those clubs so it's I guess it's just a, it was a natural thing people kind of stuck with their own group except for the Chinese nightclubs mm -hmm. you know one question came up was did you f encounter any discrimination especially in the 40s and 50s and even into well, the 60s before the civil rights uh, came to be 
Well, for me, uh, I never did. I, I don't know if you have time for me to tell you a short please, story. Please. Uh, Ron, do we have time for me yes, to tell you do. a short story? Okay. Yes. Well, in Las, when I worked in Las Vegas, uh, I was the star of the show, and we had a wonderful, beautiful singer, a black lady, and she was, um, her name was, I don't remember. Anyway, when it time, uh, just before the show started, our, man, our stage manager came back and he said, Kobe, would you please do me a favor? And I said, of course. And he said, when it comes dinner time, would you please go out to the dining room and get Lena a plate of food? I said, but why? And he says, she is not allowed in the dining room. I said, no. And I am? And he said, yes. Well, that really upset me, but I did what I had to do then. But nowadays, it's a lot different. You know, I have a lot of black uh, performers that work for me, uh, and uh, I always worked with a lot of them, and they always came around to the Dragon Lady. Brian LaHampton was one of our favorites. He used to come in and, and play the vibes. And uh, we had Johnny and Ralph Mathis. So uh, these black performers are wonderful, and I'm sure glad it changed. <laughs> My experience uh, with the Black performer was uh, working with Patti LaBelle when we were in Kingston, Jamaica. And we were just basically fighting over a dressing room because Patti LaBelle, of course, was the uh, headliner and her manager wanted her to have the main dressing room. And of course, Dorothy Toy said, no, 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 no. We are the headliners. We <laughs> must have the large dressing room. But Patti LaBelle was very gracious. And in the end, we were able to get the large dressing room from Patti LaBelle. So that was my experience. In my father's terrace bow in the 40s, he actually had a black performer. Uh, her, uh, I think her headline, headliner name was Ted I. Peters. And she was uh, a singer from Harlem. So I don't know of, of the other Chinese clubs, but my father had occasionally black performers. Uh -huh. I mean, I know that uh, a lot of uh, nightclubs advertise an all Chinese review or an all oriental. Were all the performers Chinese? Didn't they have stage names? <laughs> No, we always had a, had a, quite a conglomeration of different showgirls. You know, a lot of Filipino dancers, Korean, Japanese. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was uh, called a, a Chinese uh, review, but I think we had an international review. <laughs> but we got away with the fact that we were a Chinese nightclub in Chinatown. So they <laughs> accepted us. <laughs> Yeah, I think I was the only Chinese dancer in the group. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> Most of the uh, other performers were uh, either Japanese and uh, or Korean or Filipino. Arlene, uh, who was uh, Tony Wing's sister, of course, was Filipino. And um, we had a combination. Like I said, I was the only Chinese in the show. <laughs> Yeah, as long as you were Asian and according to Charlie Lowe, you had to have a Chinese sounding name, though. <laughs> so. Yeah. So a question came up. Um, did the performers perform exclusively in English or did you mix in any type of traditional Chinese um, music or, or traditions in your acts? Uh, I uh, had an experience when we um, found out the uh, musicians union was going to either strike or was going to, in other words, some, something came up that they would not be playing our music. So we went to recordings. So I got out some of my old Chinese records and uh, <laughs> we did a really good show. <laughs> we liked it even better. We didn't have to pay union scale to the musicians. That was really a hard nut to crack. So uh, they, they got paid very well. And then if we wanted to rehearse, they'd get paid for the rehearsal. So it, it was uh, an ongoing uh, trouble for us to even have them, you know. Oh, in fact, I remember the union told us that we have to have 
with us the size of our Forbidden City and that many chairs, you need to have eight musicians. I said, eight musicians? My goodness, that's a big nut to crack. They said, well, that's the size of your room. I said, but we don't fill the chairs. And he's, well, we finally settled on six. But that was still too many. We could have done it with a trio. <laughs> but that's the unions. Yeah. yeah. In our show, we always open with a Chinese number. Uh, we had uh, Chinese robes. And uh, for the second number, we would, uh, it was more Western. In fact, it was called Never on Sunday. And uh, for the finale, we actually had a Western number, which was a cowboy number. <laughs> we brought that same number to, uh, to San Quentin for New Year's Day. And unfortunately, they wouldn't let us use the guns. We had little plastic <laughs> guns for the cowboy number. And uh, they wouldn't let us use the guns because they said someone may take it or steal it. But uh, we were banned from using the guns in San Quentin. <laughs> So that was my experience at San Quentin. <laughs> well, you know, Sammy Tong, the guy to my, you see Sammy Tong behind me. So he was a regular MC singer at all the clubs. And he always mixed in kind of Chinese jokes and he would speak a little Cantonese and make fun of himself once in a while, a parody. And so there was a mixture of Chinese as well as American. So you gotta keep that Chinese flavor in it. So let's segue into risky business. A nightclub, as much fun as it could be, is still a business. What does it take to run a successful Chinese nightclub? Well, I know we had to have a variety, you know, it, uh, uh, we had, had to have musicians uh, that could, uh, sing we had to have a you know comedian a dance team and uh, of course all of our chinese chorus girl they always open the show and they close the show and then i had to do my exotic number which uh, was a big uh, drawing card i guess for all the tourists because they they uh, wanted to come in and see me take my clothes off well <laughs> luckily i didn't catch cold because I sure put on a lot more clothes than I would wear, you know, ordinarily, because <laughs> I said, if Charlie, if I was working with Charlie then, I said, if I have to do the a takeoff, I'm going to put on more clothes. So I made a beautiful Chinese uh, uh, opera robe. Then I made a an American robe. Then I made one that was sheer. Well, <laughs> by the time I got down to my bikini, I think they were tired, and I was too. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway I, I got through it, you know, that, that showbiz. Got to do what they want. She said, sex sells. <laughs> right, Kobe is right, sex sells. So our MC was Pat Morita. Well, he would go on right after our script number, uh, the exotic number that I was telling you about. And so he had to come up with a either a funny joke or a riddle or something. And so he had these elephant jokes and um, it, it was kind of risque, but really funny. So would you, you think it's okay if I told that joke? Go for it. <laughs> okay. <We're all> <laughs> so this was what he would ask the audience. He said, what did the elephant say to the naked man? What? what Guess, guess. What did the elephant say to the naked man? I don't know. You don't know. Calvin? I have no idea. Kobe? No, I don't know. The answer is, how do you breathe out of that thing? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so Pat Morita, he's, he's very clever. This was before he went down to Hollywood to become the Karate Kid. And um, uh, he, he would tell this joke. And if he got heckled, he would get really mad, throw down the microphone, walk off. And us dancers, we had to be ready to go on. Sound. Uh-oh. Your sound. 
sound. Sound went off. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, Cynthia's mic went off. So did mine. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. Okay. Are you back? I'm on. Yes. Okay. Sorry, you, you cut out the last uh, 30 seconds or so. Could you repeat after the, how do you breathe from that thing? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say that Pat Morita was quite temperamental. So if he ever had a heckler, he would just throw down the microphone, walk off the stage, and hopefully us girl, dan uh, us dancers would be ready for the finale. So uh -huh. uh, that's how it worked <laughs> with Pat yeah. Morita. So how different were the shows or the ambiances between the clubs? I mean, what's the difference between the Forbidden City versus Kublai Khan or Club Shanghai? How did each club have its own flavor? How did uh, you create that? I, I believe that the Forbidden City uh, was always uh, popular because uh, we were a theater restaurant large enough to have a uh, a, a big crowd that could come in for dinner, dancing, and cocktails, and a show. So probably some of the other uh, clubs uh, didn't serve dinner, whereas we had a big kitchen, and we had a big staff, and we always had a good uh, Chinese menu. So uh, I maybe that was one of the reasons that uh, a lot of the tourists did come to our place, and a lot of the locals came in to bring their friends. In fact, I remember one night um, <laughs> uh, some of the councilmen uh, in our city council brought in a king uh, and they said, hey, Kobe, there's a king out there. And I said, a king? King who? And they said, oh, his name is um, King Boudouin of, uh, no, what was his name? Uh, I forgot, you know, but it, he, he wasn't anybody that I knew. <laughs> so I said, well, okay, and Charlie said, well, you know, you got to do your full act. And I said, oh, well, okay. <laughs> so I, I have danced for a king. How about that? <laughs> life on the road. Yeah. The tough life being life a nightclub entertainer. Constant travel in the Bay Area, the country, the world, the USO, and the Chop Suey circuit. What was your most memorable or better yet, the most embarrassing thing that ever happened to you? Embarrassed me? I had a terrible experience in a theater where, you know, it's very dark backstage. They don't just have one curtain. They have two curtains. They have three curtains. Well, I'm standing there in the dark, got my fans. I'm ready to perform. My music starts. I start dancing. I can't get out of the curtains. How do I get out of here? <laughs> it's dark. So there I was, doing my act behind the curtains in the dark. Finally, somebody rescued me and pushed me out there. So embarrassing. I got through it. I'm here. <laughs> I think the most fun, actually, memory was, um, I don't know how embarrassing it was, but we were in Cuba together with Kobe. Oh, and yeah. uh, all of a sudden, we're in this outdoor theater, and it's there's a rainstorm. And all of a sudden, our stage is filled with water, lots of water. And um, they had to mop it up, and we kept on changing dressing rooms to get away from the water. And uh, <laughs> luckily, one of the guys held, held up a sheet for us. And so I was uh, dressing behind a sheet right next to the stage, which was started with water. <laughs> but the well, show goes on <laughs> yeah you know when my father first brought over his acrobats uh, from Hong Kong in the 1940s and after a few months of performing at the Terrace Bowl let's say he decided to put them on the Chinese circuit and to get further exposure uh, and also to get, uh, give the Chinese acrobats gain popularity so what he did was he, he set up the tour for them and he even loaned them his 1938 Buick, which is a fairly big car that could sit six people comfortably. He also advanced them $5,000 to 
to help pay for the expenses with the understanding that he would eventually get paid back from their earnings. On top of that, the one of the lady acrobats needed a suitcase. So my mother loaned her a big fancy suitcase. So after several months on the tour, they come back. My father greets them and he sees the Buick. And it has $2,800 worth of damages on that car, you know, which was quite a bit of money at that time. Uh-huh. Not only that, but the acrobat's costumes were torn, shredded, soiled as if they never laundered their clothes. And then my <laughs> mother's poor suitcase, who was all duct taped together because all the locks were broken off and it was was shredded. So like Kobe he says, that's maybe it's that's just show business, you know. <laughs> so I think my father learned from that. So the next topic is legacy. You had intoxicating lives. How do you want to be remembered? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, I always said that I was very fortunate to be able to make and sew costumes because my mother trained me when I was a child. So my uh, big thing is to make beautiful wardrobe costumes for show people, you know, custom made, uh, major order originals. And uh, whenever I went on the road and uh, met people, I had my sewing machine and they'd say, well, uh, you know, one day I had a gold bikini on in the pool, uh, after, you know, before the show started at night in Las Vegas. You got all this time in the afternoon. And one of the ladies said, um, where did you get that gold bikini? I said, I made it. And she said, could you make me one? I said, well, I bought my, I brought my sewing machine. Uh, and I have some fabric. I'll make you one. And so she said, oh, my gosh, I'd be so happy. So her friend said, Kobe, would you make me one? And I said, well, okay, well, I have to send for more material. Uh, I, I, I called San Francisco, send me some lame, gold lame, silver lame, bronze lame. I was in the bikini business. I tell you, I was making bikinis left and right all day long before the show. So I, I like to be rem- remembered as a costume de- designer, a good one. <laughs> You are good, Kobe. Kobe made me an outfit, and uh, I just love it. So good. Thank I you. want to be remembered uh, as as a dancer that broke barriers, that uh, was willing to uh, wear fishnet stockings, and uh, <laughs> also I want to be remembered as a good daughter, a good mother, and a good grandmother. And I also want to be remembered as someone giving back to the community. And that's why the Grant Avenue Follies was started. And um, we go to nursing homes, veteran hospitals, and help uh, nonprofit organizations raise money. And also an opportunity for, for ladies that never had the opportunity to take dancing or uh, be on the stage because their mother made them go to school and become school teachers. Our whole group, 80% are school teachers. So that's... <laughs> That's how great we are, but we have fun, a lot of fun. I think my father would like to be remembered, well, first and foremost, because he was a Chinese doctor. I think he does want to be remembered as being successfully helping people to be healed. And as far as a nightclub legacy is concerned, as I mentioned at the end of the presentation, he felt good about supporting his dependents that came over. And he gave him a solid foundation to go on independently and become successful in America. Let's have time for just one last question really quick. And that's, I want more. Where can I learn more about Chinatown nightclubs? Well, you know, there are two popular books, one by Arthur Dong, The Forbidden City USA. It's a very nice picture book and has a lot of interviews of the of the performers at that time. And there's also Trina Robbins' book, The Golden Age of Chinese Nightclubs, Forbidden City. And that's also a well done book. And it also has interviews of many of the performers. And uh, I was just thinking about uh, Lisa C's uh, China, Doll, China Dolls. Now that's a novel 
that the a lot of the people in the characters in that book are based on real life people. So that's an interesting read as well. Mm -hmm. Kobe, just as a surprise and boast to Cynthia, um, we actually got an email from a burlesque dancer named Tuna <laughs> Mermaid from Japan. And I believe that she's one of your colleagues from the Burlesque uh, Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah, that... in Las Vegas. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about the Burlesque Hall of Fame? Well, uh, it uh, every year they do have what they call uh, the Weekender in Las Vegas. And uh, all the burlesque people in the business uh, would come there and look forward to it because it was a wonderful time with all of us together. And five years ago, when I was first asked to perform there, well, I uh, up until that time, nobody knew my age. I kept it quite a, a secret. You know, I always had to lie uh, all the way uh, <laughs> during my career. Because, you know, in this business, you're either too young or you're too old. Well, anyway, five years ago, when I finished my act, the lady MC, after I finished, she said, Ladies and gentlemen, do you believe that she's 93 years old? <laughs> and my gosh, I heard that backstage. And when, when Sunday came and we could do our questions and answers, I had, to, I had to set the record straight. Ladies and gentlemen, I am not 93. I am 88. And I said, oh, my gosh, I let the cat out of the bag then. I never owned up to 88 even. <laughs> there you are. I'm. I. You know how old I am. So it doesn't matter anymore. You know, it's, it's okay. It's just that, like the agent would always say, "Well, you know, how old are you? You know, are you old enough to work in a club?" Uh, so you know, one, one last comment idea. before we move on. And there was a Whitsum Hotel um, exhibit. Can you some can say, talk a little bit about that, uh, Cynthia or Calvin? Go ahead, Cynthia. Yes, uh, Whitcomb Hotel has a wonderful uh, exhibit in their gallery of all the Forbidden City uh... Oh, you lost her. Oh, technical difficulties. Uh, Calvin, do you want to pick up on Whitcomb? Sure. The Whitcomb Hotel is a historic hotel. And um, it's right across the street from the Orpheum Theater, not too far from City Hall. And in the mezzanine, there are a very good picture gallery of all the different clubs, the Chinese clubs. And as I understand, it's on permanent display. It's open to the public. Mm -hmm. And you can go in there and go to the front desk and ask that uh, you be allowed into the mezzanine and, and look at the gallery. Right. Okay, well, there's a thousand more stories and a million more laughs. laughs. We have to bring this panel to a close. Aww. Can you please bring this slide presentation back up? Bye. Bye, Sherry. Not Bye. yet. On behalf of David Yick and myself, I wanted to thank Calvin Fong, Kobe Yi, and Cynthia Yi for the fun, fascinating, and rare view into Chinatown nightclubs. As a small token of our appreciation, each of you will receive a free membership to both our organizations oh. with heartfelt gratitude. Thank, Thank you for you. the wonderful presentation. Calvin, it's a great tribute to your father. You're a good son. Thank you. <laughs> you, Kobe <laughs> and Cynthia, great job Bye, in sharing your stories, laughter, and legacy. Be well, goodbye, and thank you for the panelists. Let's have a round of applause for them. Thank you. Thank you. Bye and bye. Bye. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Save the date, August 29th. Our August webinar will be Operation Chinese American GI. This webinar is recognized by the Department of Defense as a commemorative partner as it celebrates the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. The webinar precedes a September ceremony to honor Chinese American World War II vets. The keynote speaker is Monty Hom, the executive producer for the California ceremony, an Emmy nominated filmmaker, author, 
and military historian. I have the honor of being the chief marketing officer for this project. We will give you an update on the September ceremony, which includes military honors and a USO entertainment. We're going to take a different approach to explore Chinese American World War II history. Yes, you get the all the obligatory dates and places, but we're going to look at the war through the lens of the world's largest private collection of Chinese American military memorabilia. For example, we show a pair of boots with a medal beside it, and then we tell the rest of the story about the hero who filled these shoes. We will roll a film clip from the movie We Served with Pride, featuring 15 Chinese American World War II vets who served with uncommon valor as a common virtue. If you want to get a rare glimpse of the contributions of Chinese American veterans, or hear about the women at war and on the home front, or just have a good time, don't miss the session. Next slide, please. Dave, take it away. Hi all. We hope you all had a good time. And if so, we ask that you help our two organizations produce future webinars that educate, inspire, and remember the history of Chinese Americans. Although the webinar is free, bandwidth, hosting, and technical support are not. We thank you in advance for your generosity to help us remember the past so that we can preserve it for the future. In order to find out more, uh, please go to our website and then click on our membership tab for donation information. Next slide. The polling is, uh, responses should come up shortly. of myself and CACP, uh, we again would like to thank Calvin, Kobe, Cynthia for their time and talent, and most of all to you for your support and interest in our programs. Ron, do you have any last thoughts? Thanks for your thanks on behalf of the Bay Area Chinese Genealogy Group. It's been an honor to share and remember our roots. Just as a reminder, save the date for August 29th you receive an invitation soon to reserve a front row seat. Be well, be safe, bye for now. Cue up closing slide, please. <laughs>